views and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lupus podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Friday, June 25th, 2021. Today's episode is about, in lupus, keep BP below 130, over 80. We'll see why researchers state that. Also, what is whole person's health? And do you know what TEL is? Well, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with lupus. You know what time it is. All the way from the United States to Stockholm, Sweden. Get ready to grab your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, and to my listeners late at night. You know I appreciate you. So get ready and go ahead and grab your favorite glass of wine and join the conversation right here on my story living with lupus podcast Ophthalmology Associates, PC, Drs. Berman and Dr. Zuckerbrod, treating diseases of the eye and eye surgery. You can reach them at 313-341-3450. In lupus, keep BP below 130 over 80. Now, blood pressure should be maintained at a level below 130 over 80 in all patients with lupus to lessen their likelihood of arteriosclerotic vascular events. Canadian researchers asserted in a study of patients enrolled in the University of Toronto Lupus Clinic, those who adjusted mean blood pressures was in the range of 130 through 139 over 80 through 89 during the first two years after enrollment had a 73% higher risk of an A Theriosclerotic vascular event compared with those whose blood pressure was below the 130 over 80 threshold. According to Murray Urowitz and colleagues of the University of Toronto, that reflected a hazard ratio of 1.73 after adjustment for traditional lupus-related risk factors. They reported online in annuals of the rheumatic diseases. In 2018, the American College of Cardiology 
American Heart Association published revised guidelines on the management of hypertension in adults, lowering the threshold for hypertension from 140 over 90 to 130 over 80 with levels from 130 through 139 over 80 through 89, now being considered stage one hypertension and 140 over 90 being stage two. And despite the inclusion of various risk groups in the guideline, there were no recommendations for patients with connective tissue diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus, who have a five-fold increased risk over their lifetime of atherosclerotic vascular events such as angina, acute MI cerebral vascular events. Moreover, traditional cardiovascular risk calculators typically underestimates risk among patients with lupus because they don't account for the disease-related risks and usually are designed for use in individuals older than age 40. Accordingly, treatment of hypertension in lupus patients may be unnecessarily delayed, worsening their risk and prognosis. Furthermore, hypertension has been related to every surrogate endpoint for arteriosclerosis, including impaired endothelial function, arterial stiffness, increased carotid, media thickness, plaque formation, coronary artery calcification, and coronary artery disease, researchers noted. Therefore, to help provide guidance on hypertension for clinicians caring for patients with lupus, Eurowitz and colleagues analyze data from their cohort which has enrolled more than 2,000 patients since 1970. Their analysis included 1,532 patients who had at least two years follow-up and who had not previously had an atherosclerotic event. Almost 90% were female, mean age was 36, and disease duration average 60 years. Adjusted mean blood pressure over the first two years of follow-up was above 140 over 90 in 10.1% from 130 through 139 over 80 through 89 in 20.6% and below 130 over 80 in the remaining 69.3%. These adjusted blood pressures were based on an average of 6.3 measurements over the two years, which accounted for the fluctuation in blood pressure that are typical in lupus. After a mean follow-up of 10.8 years, 
there were 124 AVEs, including 20 cardiovascular deaths. Other events commonly reported including new onsets of angina in 40 patients, acute MI in 23, and cerebral vascular events in 18. The prevalence of AEs was 20.6 in the group whose blood pressure was above 40, 140 over 90, 13% in those whose levels were 130 through 139 over 80 through 89, and 4.8% in those below 130 over 80, while incident rates were 18.9, 11.5, and 4.5 per 1,000 patient years, respectfully. The Kaplan Mir curve for AEs over time showed statistically significant differences between norm invasive patients, those with stage one hypertension, also between stage one and stage two. On a multivariant analysis, factors other than stage one hypertension that were associated with AVE events includes use of anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents, smoking, glucocorticoids, disease activity index, a sensitivity analysis that excluded 30 patients with end-stage renal disease had similar results as the primary analysis. The findings of the present study support that the target blood pressure should be less than 130 over 80 in all patients with lupus in order to minimize their cardiovascular risk. They also question whether further lowering of blood pressure could be beneficial and referred to a population-wide study from Sweden that included 187,000 patients with type 2 diabetes. In that study, the lowest risk for non-fatal AEs was seen with blood pressures of 110 through 119 systolic, but that level was associated with an increase in risk for heart failure of 20% and for all-cause mortality of 28%. Now, based on these data, targeting lower levels of blood pressure might be unsafe in certain patients with lupus, with, especially with prior heart disease or heart failure. So, be careful and always speak with your physician if you are unsure of what your what you should be maintaining your blood pressure levels at stay with me i'll be right back
If you would like to appear on an episode of My Story Living with Lupus, you can contact us at mystorylivingwithlupus at gmail.com. Also visit us on our Instagram page and also our website, My Story Living with Lupus. Why is whole person's health important? Just think about that. Why is whole person's health important? Health and disease are not separate. Disconnected states, but instead occur on a path that can move in two different directions, either toward health or towards disease. Now, on this path, many factors, including one's biological makeup, some unhealthy behaviors, such as poor diet, sedentary lifestyle, chronic stress, and poor sleep, as well as social aspects of life. The conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and yes, age, can lead to chronic diseases of more than one organ system. On the other hand, self-care, lifestyle and behavioral interventions may help with the return to health. Now we know chronic diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, degenerative joint disease can also occur with chronic pain, depression, and opioid misuse. All conditions exacerbated by chronic stress. Some chronic diseases increase the immediate and long-term risks. Understanding the condition in which a person has lived, addressing the behaviors at an early stage, and managing stress can not only prevent multiple diseases, but also help restore health and stop the progression to disease across a person's lifespan. Now, is whole person health being used now in healthcare? Now, some healthcare systems and programs are now focusing more on whole person's health. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Whole Health Approach, the VA's Whole Health System of Care and Whole Health Approach aims to improve the health and well-being of veterans and to address lifestyle and environmental root causes of chronic disease. The approach shifts from a disease-centered focus to a more personalized approach that engages and empowers veterans early in and throughout their lives to prioritize healthy 
lifestyle changes in areas like nutrition, activity, sleep, relationships, and surroundings. Conventional testing and treatment are combined with complementary and integrative health approaches that may include acupuncture, biofeedback, massage therapy, yoga, and meditation, which was mentioned on last week's episode. Now, the U.S. Department of Defense Total Force Fitness Program arose within the U.S. Department of Defense military health system in response to the need for more holistic approach, a focus on the whole person instead of separate parts or only symptoms to the demands of multiple deployments and the strains on the U.S. Armed Forces and family members. The Whole Health Institute, which was established in 2020, model helps people identify what matters most to them, and build a plan for their journey to whole health. The model provides tools to help people take good care of their body, mind, spirit, and involves working with a healthcare team as well as tapping into the support of family, friends, and yes, communities. Now, in North Carolina, Department of Health and Human Services has incorporated a whole person health approach into its healthcare system by focusing on integrating physical, behavioral, and social health. The state has taken steps to encourage collaborative behavioral health care and help resolve widespread inequities in social conditions such as housing and nutritious food access. The Ornish Program for Reversing Heart Disease is an intensive cardiac rehabilitation program that has been shown to reverse the progression of coronary heart disease through lifestyle changes without drugs or surgery. The program is covered by Medicare and some health insurance companies. The program's lifestyle changes includes exercising, smoking cessation, stress management, social support, and a whole food plant-based diet low in total fat. The program is offered by a team of healthcare professionals who provide the support that individuals need to make and maintain lasting changes in lifestyle. What does research show about whole person's health? A growing body of research suggests the benefits of healthy behaviors, environments, and policies to maintain health and prevent, treat, 
reverse chronic diseases. This research includes several large, long-term epidemiological studies, such as the Farmington Ham Heart Study. There is a lack, however, of random dyes, controlled trials, and other types of research of multi-component interventions and whole person's health. Challenges come with conducting this type of research with findings appropriate ways to assess the evidence, but opportunities are emerging to explore new paths toward reliable, rigorous research on whole person's health. Have you ever heard of let, L-E-T, T-L-E? It's all a form of lupus, a subset of lupus. I bet you no one never told you that. You want to know what T-L-E stands for or let stands for? Let does not stand for, let me have a piece of that. It's tumid lupus erythematosus, which is a rare but distinctive entity in which patients present with erythematosus plaque, usually on the trunk. Lupus erythematosus, tumid was reported by Henry Gergrat and Bruner R. in 1930. It is a photosensitive skin disorder, a different subtype of cutaneous lupus from discoid lupus or subacute CLE. Let is usually found on sun-exposed areas of the body, skin lesions, annular papules of plaque. Topical corticoid steroids are not effective as treatment for let, but many will respond to chloroquine. Let resolves with normal skin, no residual scarring, no hyperpigmentation, or hypopigmentation. Cigarette smokers who have let may not respond very well to chloroquine. Tumid arrhythmatosis lupus is considered a rare sub. Um, a rare type, I shouldn't say subtype right now, a rare type of chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus. CLE can be divided into acute cutaneous lupus, subacute cutaneous lupus, and chronic cutaneous lupus. Tumid erythematosus lupus is characterized by smooth, non-scarring, pink to violet-colored pimples on the skin without any other apparent skin changes, such as scarring. Patients with tumid lupus erythematosus usually do not have other symptoms of SLE or other types of continuous lupus erythematosus. The papules appear on sun-exposed 
areas of the face, the upper back, the area of the neck, trunk, and arms, and are more rarely on thighs and legs. They usually affect equally both sides of the body, but may affect only one side. Normally, the papules clear without leaving scars. The treatment is very effective in most cases and may include sun protection, anti-malarial drugs, local corticosteroids, and light therapy. Lupus erythematosus is an inflammatory disorder of the immune system. Within the immune system attacks the body's own organs and systems. There are different types of lupus erythematosus, including systemic, discoid, neonatal, and tumid. Tumid lupus erythematosus, or TLE, is perhaps the rarest forms. However, advances in medical treatment have become extremely successful, and most patients with tumid lupus erythematosus are still able to live comfortable lives. While all types of lupus erythematosus are caused by an autoimmune response. They each affect distinct areas of the body and often stem from varied and misguided responses by the immune system. Tumid lupus erythematosus is actually a variation of discoid lupus, DLE, as both types of lupus affects the skin. Debate is going on in the medical community as to whether or not the tumid form is actually a variation or simply consistent in nature with known cutaneous forms of lupus erythematosus like discoid lupus. Tumid lupus erythematosus, however, does appear to penetrate the skin more deeply than discoid form of lupus. Signs and symptoms. In order for treatment of tumid lupus to be effective, patients need to seek attention at the first onset of the symptoms, it is important to note that no two patients are likely to experience the exact same symptoms. For this reason, patients should be aware of all possible signs and symptoms related to tumid lupus. In a simple form, Lupus is not a one-size-fits-all illness. Now for the signs. Red rash of the face typically covering the cheeks and bridge of the nose. Skin lesions. Sun sensitivity. Fever. Now risk factors. The originating cause of tumid lupus erythematosus still remains a mystery, just like SLE. However, after years of scientific study, medical research have been able to identify some key contributing factors. Risk factors can include ethnicity, with forms of lupus being more common and patients of African, Asian, and Spanish descent. Excessive sun exposure. It is not altogether clear 
which patients are more likely to be susceptible to sun exposure that will cause tumor lupus erythematosus. But it is suspected that sunlight may cause proteins to develop on the surface of the skin. Antibodies within the body are in direct conflict with this as they attach to these proteins and create misguided response from the immune system. Epstein-Barr virus, patients who are infected with the Epstein-Barr virus at any point throughout their lives are more likely to de develop tumid lupus erythematosus. Although the reasoning for this is not scientifically clear. In addition, patients with other types of autoimmune disorders like Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, Graves' disease, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis are at an elevated risk for developing tumid lupus erythematosus. For reasons unknown, women are much more likely than men to develop this particular form of lupus. Now, when it comes down to the method of treatment for tumid lupus, treating tumid lupus erythematosus can be done with both oral or topical medications, oral anti-inflammatory drugs like naproxen, ibuprofen can be helpful systematically alleviating swelling and inflammation. Topical corticosteroids are also commonly prescribed for patients with tumid lupus erythematosus. Complementary, alternative, or integrative health. I thank you so much for joining me for another episode of my story living with lupus podcast before i go i want to say several things to you if you're listening on apple podcasts spreaker or spotify please subscribe rate and review you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And lastly, you know, a truly strong person does not need the approval of others any more than a lion needs the approval of a sheep. I'll say that one more time. A truly strong person does not need the approval of others any more than a lion needs the approval of sheep. I'm Susan Hendricks, your host for my story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I wish you a most peaceful, positive, safe, and oh so blessed weekend. I'll see you next week for another episode.